This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. Hello and welcome to The Unstoppable Indian. Every week we take a journey into the life of an outstanding Indian, a person whose talent, acumen or moral example is transforming India. The best, the finest from every field, business, science, literature, art, entertainment. Join me, Mandi Dhillon, on the show to share their life story, their journey to success, the knocks along the way, what made them get up and keep going, what makes them an unstoppable Indian. My guest today is Raghunath A. Marshalkar. Some call him India's most dynamic scientist. He's done pioneering work in polymer science and engineering, but he's also shaped India's science and technology policies, India's patent regime. For 13 years, he served as Director General of CSIR, the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, a chain of 38 publicly funded R&D institutes. His aim was, let's take science out of the labs, to the people, to the factory floors, and make it relevant. He made some serious headway on that front. Dr. Marshalkar, thank you very much for joining us thank you. today. We're here in Pune at the National Chemical Laboratory. It's a place where you also served as director before your CSIR stint. And you're here again. But I want to go back to the beginning, to the 50s. A young boy who went barefoot to school, studied by street lamps, two meals a day, and it was a tough life. What were those years like? Yes, it was uh, indeed a, a tough life. Uh, you know, I was born in a very poor family. My father died when I was six. Uh, my mother came to Bombay. She practically did manual work to bring me up. Uh, two meals a day was a huge issue. I did walk barefoot until I was 12. I did study under street lights. I remember those days when uh, I went to a Marathi school, a municipal school, passed the seventh standard with flying colors. I stood first with 88%. But to get admission into the secondary school required uh, admission fee of 21 rupees. And to uh, generate that money took us uh, almost three weeks, you know. So those were very, very hard times uh, indeed. Uh, I uh, passed SSC, the 11th standard exam from the board, standing 11th among 135,000 students, but was about to leave the school because my mother couldn't afford uh, uh, me to continue studies, you know. And uh, came Sir Dharap uh, Tata Trust Scholarship, 60 rupees per month for six years. You know, 60 rupees a month did not take away much from the Tatas, but added so much value to my life. To your life? Yes. What made you turn to science? I believe it was something your principal, uh, who was also your physics teacher, said to you, which made you choose the field of science. Yes, uh, absolutely. You know, I, as I said, it was very difficult to get admissions in top schools because I ran out of time because those 21 rupees took so much time to get. So finally I ended up in a school called Union High School. And uh, we, I had uh, a, a physics teacher, uh, Bhave sir, as we used to call him. And I remember on a Friday afternoon he took us out into the sun to actually show to us how to find the focal length of a convex lens. He had a piece of paper, he had that convex lens, he moved it up and down till there was a bright point and he said this is the focal length and then he held it for a little while and uh, the paper burnt and for some reason he turned to me and he said you know uh, Mashilka like this if you focus your energies you can uh, burn anything you can achieve anything now it did two things for me one it gave me philosophy of life focus and you can achieve anything two I said the power of science is so fantastic I must become a scientist that's how I became a uh, scientist. You know, I look at your academic record. You had a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Bombay University. You got offers to study abroad, and then you did have some brief stints uh, in the UK and the US, but you chose to come back to India fairly early. Why was that? Oh, that's uh, very interesting. I remember uh, Dr. Naiduma, who was then the director general of CSI, a position that I subsequently was to occupy, came to London. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi, who was then the prime minister, was sick and tired of our young people, uh, you know, wanting to come back, not getting an opportunity. Harbans Kurana came, he didn't get a job, 
went to US and got a Nobel Prize. So there's a big uh, discussion on why this happens. And she told Dr. Nayaduma, just go, look at the best and the brightest and invite them. Let them not send applications and form filling and so on and so forth. So I simply got a message from Dr. Nayaduma. He's coming to London. He met me in Savoy Hotel, just a half an hour inspirational talk. And he talked about the new India that was emerging. I was in my early 30s, you know. Uh, I had a wonderful job, a house, a car, everything. And he made an uh, offer to me. And I, you know, I, I don't think from here. I think from here. I just said yes. Phoned up my wife in the evening and I said, you know, the nation is calling us, let's go back. And she's a great lady. She said, let's go back. That's why I came on a princely salary of 2,100 rupees per month uh, in this laboratory, National Chemical Laboratory. November 15, 1976, I still remember my first day. You know, I feel like quoting something that actually um, I've heard from you. Uh, this is uh, the Italian scientist Riario Giacconi. He's a Nobel laureate, of course, in physics. And he says, a scientist is like a painter, and Michelangelo was given a wall to paint, and that uh, Giacconi was given his wall to paint in the United States. My question is this, did India give you, Dr. Mashelkar, your wall to paint? Absolutely. The lab that you see around here didn't exist when I came here. This entire polymer science engineering building didn't exist. And they trusted me and they invested um, uh, in me and gave me the full opportunity. You know, it is from this laboratory that I did the work, uh, which earned me the fellowship of Royal Society. Uh, only three uh, engineers, Indian engineers in the 20th century have been elected to fellowship of Royal Society. That work I could do here. They give me that opportunity. You know, if you look at U.S. National Academy of Science, from 1668, more than 140 years, only seven Indian scientists have been elected to the fellowship. Sometimes it is even more difficult to uh, get than the Nobel Prize. You know, Sir Harry Kruto got the Nobel Prize first and then was elected to U.S. National Academy of Science five years later. I was elected based on what? Based on the work that I did here. They did give me the wall to pen. But, you know, again, I'm going to refer to something that you've actually referenced uh, in your conversations and your speeches. It was a tough time to actually be working as a scientist in India. You know, there's a particular in the mid-70s, it took you two years to buy one type of flow meter for your work in yeah, polymers. Yeah, yeah. You didn't have access to a basic computer. We take it for granted. Um, journals, what's going on in the rest of the world of science. You had to wait to be abreast of what's happening. Surely uh, that, that must have been difficult given that you had already experienced what it's like in the UK. Absolutely. No, I, I think you are spot on. Those were very difficult times, by the way, uh, personally as well as professionally. Personally, I still remember my wife had to cook on a kerosene stove yes. because a uh, gas cylinder, we had to wait for an year. Uh, I, I remember to get my first telephone took me six years. It's a different India today. Just last month, seven million mobiles have been uh, sold. That was not the India. Professionally, I remember 32K was a big memory. Today we make our own teraflop computers. Journals used to come by sea mail, you know, uh, for four months, three months they used to take. So we were out of date even before we begin, be, uh, began. Here today in this laboratory itself, we have 5,000 journals plus, uh, which are available on the web and they see it on the same day, same time or even earlier than their competitors in Harvard and Caltech can. But, but you know, there's a point I want to draw from that. Does a certain amount of deprivation actually sharpen that desire to succeed? Mm. We're sitting in the new India mm. where, you know, we can take many more things for granted than, than you could. Mm. But does that necessarily make us more competitive, more hungry in the field of scientific research? Indeed, indeed. You know, the idea is to get more from less. And you cannot get more from less unless you are creative, you are innovative. And that's what India did. For example, you are absolutely right. My Weisenberg reorganometer R18, that model I still remember, <laughs> it took me two years because we didn't have foreign exchange. Today we talk about $270 billion plus. Today we talk about our being fourth uh, foreign exchange reserve holder in the world. Uh, at that time, uh, a dollar was so difficult. It took me two years to get it. So what do I do for two years? Do I just sit around? I said, no. What has God given me? I can't do that experiment because uh, uh, those organometers are not available, but God has given me something, which is this. So you know what I did? I turned to modeling and simulation. Modeling and simulation were used only this. And the work that I did on polyester fiber uh, modeling simulation chain became classic, actually. It became a textbook stuff. 
I got my first uh, award, the Bhatnagar Prize, uh, SS Bhatnagar Prize, which is a scientist in India cherishes, just based on that work, just by using this. But tell me if you'd been born in the India of the 70s or the 80s, would you still have chosen to be a scientist? Oh, yes. You see the number of opportunities around today. Do you think that they would have steered you towards another path? Yes, I, I think that's, uh, that's a very interesting uh, uh, question. In fact, today we do have a crisis, by the way. The best of minds do not turn to science. And those who turn to science do not stay in science because there are opportunities, whether it is information technology, whether it is management, banking, finance, and so on. But India of tomorrow can't be built if uh, uh, science and technology doesn't become the bedrock on which we create our socio-economic transformations. And therefore, I think we must go all out today to get the very best minds uh, come to science. Mm -hmm.